Hello, once again, friends. Welcome to another episode of Strange Planet. And if you'd like to get deeper into Strange Planet, you might want to consider becoming a premium subscriber. It's real easy to do. Just click on the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. There are three monthly uh, premium subscriber tiers to choose from. Choose the one that's right for you, but you gain access to commercial-free listening, special bonus episodes produced exclusively for premium subscribers, and you also receive my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. On this episode... We're going to speak with a, um, a skilled hypnotherapist who specializes in regression work with individuals who believe they've had extra or ultra terrestrial contact or other experiences of high strangeness. And we'll also tell you about an upcoming conference you're going to want to know about, particularly if you live in the Toronto area or anywhere um, within a few hours drive or a short flight. Anyway, uh, we're going to get into this right now with Leslie Mitchell Clark, who is a Toronto-based certified clinical hypnotherapist who specializes in a number of modalities, including working with individuals who feel they've had experiences with extraterrestrial beings. Uh, Most of this fascinating work, as well as metaphysical therapies such as past life and inner life regression, take place at Leslie's Toronto Hypnosis Clinic, Lightwork Hypnosis. Prior to her work in hypnotherapy, Leslie also had a busy career as an actor, dancer, vocalist, and for the past 20 plus years, she's been a top jazz and arts media consultant with an array of Grammy and Juno award winning clients, as well as major jazz festivals and record labels. Leslie is currently the director of LMC Media, which has offices both in Toronto and Leslie's hometown of New York City. She's also a busy arts writer, contributing regularly to a variety of publications. And uh, she is the co-author, along with Wes Roberts, of Intersection, a true story of extraterrestrial contact. Leslie Mitchell Clark. Hello. Welcome. Wow. I'm exhausted after that introduction. (laughs) I feel like the goddess Shiva with like eight <laughs> arms or what have you. You would have um, to have eight arms to do all of that. <laughs> I assure you, I do know how to relax. So it's re- don't worry. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, let's begin uh, immediately with uh, the Contact and Disclosure Symposium, mm. which is happening uh, April 20th uh, in Toronto. Tell us all about it. Oh, thank you, Richard. Well, as as you well know, in Canada, we are ground zero for an awful lot of high strangeness. Mm. We have our own amazing tales that have happened and, and real life experiences. And we even have, you know, the University of Montreal admitting to their, you know, bizarre experiments. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot going on. And we, up until a few years ago, we had a fairly solid excuse me, um, convention called Alien Cosmic Expo, which Mm. we did in conjunction. It was really a MUFON. uh, It became a MUFON project. Well, unfortunately, um, that convention did not survive uh, COVID. And, of course, there are many financial issues. And um, so eventually myself and three of my uh, fellow wizards decided to step forward and create our own event in you know keeping with our um, um, our uh, what what shall I say our embracing of various points of view mm-hmm. various modalities um, now this year it's it's just a one-day event, um, and it's taking place as Richard, as you said, on April twentieth, at um, a, a fabulous spot called the Off World Bar. If you've never been there, Richard, you got to take the misses and 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 check it out. It is like a, it's a movie set, really. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but you're gonna you're gonna love it. So uh, and yet we we are able to, you know, handle probably at least two hundred guests. So that's what we're hoping for this first year now the um our i guess you could call it our keynote speaker this year is um 
course, the noted attorney, author, disclosure activist, uh, Daniel Sheehan. Mm. So we're very excited about that. And our own, your own Victor Vigiani will be interviewing uh, Mr. Sheehan. And, and we are Zooming him in. However, he's going to be taking questions from the audience. And uh, so uh, we also are... Uh, and. For another point of view, we're also presenting uh, now Colonel Randy Kramer, USMCSS, and he's going to be discussing uh, not only the secret space program and related topics, but he has also uh, founded a kind of an educational institution, and he's teaching um, psionics, which is a sort of um, uh, military grade uh, type of not only remote viewing, but involves a lot of different disciplines. So uh, that's those are three of the people. We're also going to have Mike Patterson, oh, yes. who, who you I know you've uh, mm-hmm. interviewed before, and he's the uh, um, director of Sasquatch Ontario. So Mike, as opposed to all of these other so-called, uh, you know, uh, Sasquatch investigators who want to go out there with guns and stuff like that, Mike, I think because of his gentle nature, I can't say exactly why it is, but he he has developed a personal relationship with a specific family of Sasquatch that goes back 20 years. And so his evidence, uh, uh, his uh, both um, auditory and physical is beyond anything that uh, that I have ever seen. And, you know, so so that's and there will be a, a few other guests as well that we're working on to finalize. But if you would love to go and you live essentially in the Toronto area or, or a reasonable drive or plane or whatever, uh, you can get tickets at Eventbrite. That's event, B-R-I-T-E dot C-A. Or if you wish, you can go right to our website, which is Contact and Disclosure Symposium Dot com, and you can also get your tickets uh, that way. Uh, and contact and disclosure symposium dot com, and the links are in the uh, the episode description for this uh, for this episode. Um, so th- this coming together of like minded people th- uh, to put on this symposium, you're calling it the Canadian Contact Collective, and uh, one of the um, uh, members is Wes Roberts, of course, yes. who was uh, your your co author. Yes. Um, for intersections, a true story of extraterrestrial contact, uh, and he sort of is the the um, the subject of the book because yes. he, he was a um, uh, a college professor uh, with a life uh, time worth of uh, encounters um, uh, with uh, with ETs. Yes. Um, so th- this is maybe a nice entree into. Uh, d- Descri- describing your work as a, a hypnotherapist uh, in uh, in this field of regression, um, and how you I mean prior to um, meeting Wes Roberts, what was your uh, experience with ufology and and uh, and disclosure and so forth? Well, it's always been a fascination since my dad, you know, pulled out the first telescope and I looked at an eclipse or so, a lunar mm-hmm. eclipse, but it's always been a fascination. And indeed, when I was around 16 years old and a young um, apprentice actor at a Summerstock theater, I had a series of experiences which definitely proved to me that we are not alone. So uh, propelled by that, it has always been an interest. Now, when I first became uh, a hypnotherapist, or at that time, a hypnotist, I guess you could better say, over the first level of, of, uh, of training, um, I was very interested in the metaphysical hypnosis of all sorts, which primarily involves past life and interlife regression. So I worked my way, you know, through the different trainings, and eventually I was uh, certified and qualified to do that type of work, which I think most hypnotherapists will agree that is the trickiest thing that we do. And it's the only thing that a hypnotist is ever sued for. Hmm. <laughs> the, only, the only thing. So it's a tricky deal, and you have to be properly trained. Now, I I didn't reinvent the wheel. I just want to make that really clear. I don't want any pomposity here. I simply adapted tried and true 
regression techniques that have been used by um, my mentor, Dr. Georgina Cannon. She re- she refined the work of Michael Newtonian, uh, Michael Newton rather. So, or you'd say I'm a Newtonian uh, a hypnotherapist, but I simply uh, adapted those methods. Now, how it happened that I first began working with these dear individuals is I was uh, I. I was working in a pretty upscale uh, hypnosis clinic uh, designed for wealthy older ladies. <laughs> <I've> been, <laughs> it shall remain nameless. Anyway, I was working there, and about once a month, uh, because this was a very known place, and Shirley MacLaine had gone there, and so about once a month, an individual would call the clinic and say, well, I have, you know, I have missing time or I woke up with a handprint on my shoulder, you know, any number of these, what we now to be know to be really familiar signposts of activity. So no one else in the clinic, even the most senior people who were also, you know, psychologists and, and uh, psychotherapists, they didn't want it. They wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Hmm. And I said, you know what? I have a feeling that this is what I'm supposed to do. I mean, really. So I said, send these people to me. And um, I think it was a um, an agreement or a wish that I put out into the universe because before you knew it, um, I was just having more of these clients than I could even handle. And um, then eventually um, I worked primarily and I now work entirely at my own space. So, um, but I I came to specialize it in this work, and there was some trial and error because believe me, you know, not everyone who contacts you and says that they are an ET experiencer is an ET experiencer. Right? How do you separate the the experiencer, the genuine experiencer, from someone with, let's say, an underlying mental uh, illness? Mm, very good question. Well. It's the same type of process, really, that I use for any hypnotherapy that I do, because in the province of Ontario, we're not allowed legally to treat anyone who has been diagnosed with a mental illness. Now, by that, um, I don't mean just anxiety or depression or phobias. I I mean something like borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, psychosis, you know, and people with those diagnoses do have um they can have an, a life of delusion and they can call in and and imagine that these things are happening so i always do a very thorough intake either on the phone or in person it used to always be in person but now you know since covid we do things a little differently so i do a very thorough intake and i can tell you by the questions that i ask the feelings that i have the way the person responds to me. And if I can see them, you know, eye contact, I'm also an NLP practitioner, which means that I can really sort of read what's going on in people's minds simply by observing their facial Mm -hmm. reactions. So I have a very good idea by the time I'm done with that intake that someone is of sound mind and is a legitimate experiencer or not. Now, I don't just hang those poor people out to dry, Richard, who have called me and who I feel are unwell, because being mentally unwell does not necessarily preclude the idea that there have been experiences. Exactly. I mean, if you've had, if you've had a lifetime, if you've had a lifetime of repressed uh, alien encounters, I mean, one would imagine that could contribute to your mental health. Oh, oh uh, yes. Oh yes. And, uh, even, you know, today there, uh, there are, is a wide range of coping abilities. You know, some genuine experiencers are high functioning, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're teachers, a preponderance of teachers, by the way. Hmm. Uh, maybe if I would have to say any profession, does it have a bigger slice of the pie? I would have to say it's it's educators. Um, and, uh, you know, so what I do is I have a number of uh, psychiatrists and uh, colleagues who are psychotherapists who are also open to this phenomena, phenomena, if you wish to call it that. And so they will then, I will refer this these dear people on to them who can address legally the mental health issues. 
So, but I'm back in school, so it won't be long before I'll be a member of the College of Psychotherapy and I won't have those limitations anymore. Ah, all right. So the, um, how does this work now with a, um, a, a hypnotic regression with someone who uh, suspects maybe they've mm -hmm. had a, an encounter, maybe been taken aboard a craft or, or what have you? How, does, how do you get into this with, with, the, with the client? Well, like Kathy Martin, one of my other great mentors, I, I have a little rule where, where someone has to come to me with at least a partially recalled memory. Now, it can be from a dream. It doesn't have to be something in, you know, 3D, but uh, they have to come with at least, you know, a starting point. So what I generally do is... We take, if there is more than one uh, salient memory or whatever seems to be have the most information and the meaning it's the closest to the surface, that's the memory we go for. So in, um, in regression, we to get the um, uh, the memory process is sort of oiled up, you know, we I used to say lubed up, but it sounded so rude. <laughs> <laughs> we get them oiled up so that we can, we say, I bring someone back through the teenage years and I have them pick out only happy memories and we go back and back and back. And then after we've done that a little bit and I've got the person moving around really fluidly in their past and recalling things that they could have never remembered consciously. And when I can tell that they are at least in a deep alpha state, if not a theta state, then I gently direct them with a variety of techniques into the experience itself. And usually, Richard, that's all it takes. Usually it's off to the races after that. So I try to process at least three experiences in a in a session which is will last about two hours i think going longer than that uh, contrary to what they used to do i think going longer than that is not is not optimum for the uh the patient or the client it takes too long for them to reintegrate if you have them under that long so two hours is my cutoff point now what i will if i suspect and we may just hear this naturally anyway like i may say when is the first, have you ever seen this type of blank before? Yes. Well, can you, let's travel now to the first time that you saw blank. And uh, inevitably, we'll be talking with a three-year-old child or something like that. So That's when it I begins would, typically, around three? Typically. that I And it may even begin earlier, but I think that's the only point where we can get some type of verbal response where, you know, the memory, they're able that the child, the being is able to describe what is happening. And it may be an extremely simple language, but I did have one. I had one and this wasn't very long ago. Uh, new stuff is always coming up. So I had this lovely gal, again, a teacher, right? Completely functioning member of society, right? Uh, completely believable, and she said, "I'm, I'm little." I, so she began talking almost as if she, as if she was observing, rather than experiencing. So she said, "I see my my little body, my little baby body, on a kind of a conveyor belt, and we're moving through some type." of machinery but also people are people are looking at us and i said well can you describe these people to me you know so that that's kind of what happened and as it turned out she was on board uh, some type of craft where there was some sort of collaborative research going on which believe me is completely common and uh, was being um, examined probably with very in, with very benign instrumentation so as not to harm these babies and also a physical touching and just you know an examination from from beings that were both humanoid i mean in, indistinguishably humanoid from us and also um uh, a, a type of gray a tall gray so that was about as early so i'm guessing that we were talking about six-month-old babies or even younger. 
is my guess. And uh, we'll, we'll take a quick time out. We'll come back and um, we'll discuss further uh, as to whether, for example, uh, these encounters are always benign or can they mm-hmm. also have an element of malevolence as well. Uh, Leslie Mitchell Clark is with us. And again, the uh, Contact and Disclosure Symposium 2024 happening April 20th right here in Toronto at the Off World Bar. Uh, click on the link in the episode notes to get uh, tickets and more information. Back with more of our conversation right after these. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Leslie Mitchell Clark is part of the Canadian <clears throat> Contact Collective, and the Canadian Contact Collective is um, hosting a Contact and Disclosure Symposium happening April 20th uh, at the Off World Bar. I've got to get down there and check it out. Off World Bar. To. <laughs> <laughs> 739 Queen Street West in Toronto, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., April 20th. And um, uh, Daniel Sheehan will be there, uh, Mike Patterson from. Uh, Sasquatch, Ontario. Uh, Victor Vigiani, our good friend and colleague, mm-hmm. will be there uh, interviewing uh, Daniel Sheehan. Colonel Randy Kramer, of course, will be there to talk about the uh, secret space uh, program. Um, so these um, encounters that you're uncovering through regression, <clears throat> uh, are, are, they, are they always benign or are they also occasionally um, malevolent? Okay, well, that's a very appropriate question, Richard, and one that I'm very happy to answer. Now, I what I'm going to say is I'm just going to repeat uh, the 10-year results of uh, Kathleen Martin's Experiencer Research Project, of which I was a big participant. In other words, M- MUFON sent me many people to regress that they felt were, you know, appropriate. So what what the results pointed to is that only 30% of the experiences were frightening or negative. So 70% of the time, the experiences were either benign or even, you know, ecstatic and wonderful. And some experiencers are even more attached to their, shall we say, ET colleagues and family than they are attached here in the third density on, uh, you know, on the, in the cruel school, you know, where we live. So, um, and what I would have to say is I think, you know, some of the most disturbing things that I, that I've heard about, um, the experiencer would have to be at least my age because they are part of the, um, shall we say the Truman Eisenhower agreement, which allowed the Zeta reticulites to, um, take a certain number of uh, humans and extract genetic material. Um, And they did honor their agreement and it timed out in, I'm going to say, I'm going to say the late eighties. I mean, I wasn't there for the signing, so I don't really know, but what I can tell you is most of the experiences that I do hear about, which is still few are, um, would have taken place in the early 60s 
when someone was an adolescent, so they would have to be at, at least my age. And and it's and it's still it's still rare. Mostly, mostly what's going on in my office is sensitive, intelligent people realizing that they are special and they are here and they are actually having almost another lifetime when they sleep because it's it would seem that his experiencers mature and learn more skills and engage with whatever group of ETs they're engaging with. Um, the experiences seem to become more like astral projection or remote viewing. In other words, the actual need to go on board a craft with your physical body seems to become less important once you pass through your teen years. And I do know from what clients have told me that there are there are a number of um, ET species in our corner of the galaxy that find space travel such a hassle that they prefer to project themselves in a kind of a ultra uh, ultra amazing holographic type of way in other words it doesn't look like the, what we think of as, as holograms but these beings can present three dimensionally and there are um, there are insectoid beings that are very very good at that and by the way you know I, I would have to say that um, as above so below there are benevolent insectoids they are kind of nasty insectoids the same goes with reptilians i think we have a great you know being descended from a mammalian strain of evolution if you will i think we have a very very difficult time accepting other sophisticated forms of life that have evolved from say the reptilian i mean we have a reptilian brain we have all mm. kinds of stuff going on but we're very very queasy um and i have to think about you know we think about well when will we be allowed to join the you know the galactic federation or whatever organization it is and we can't even get along within our own countries you know we we you know we we are still you know there's racism is still like massive so, you know, we're, I, I think there must be a great sense of, of disgust sometimes from the more involved ETs because, you know, they, there seems to be a Gene Roddenberry-like um, non-intervention mm -hmm. type of deal because I simply I have heard this repeated many times because um, now some of my clients, including Wes Roberts, what they're doing in the chair is it's more like channeling. I induce them into a state of receptivity and then we can ask questions in real time because time doesn't even exist in reality in the way we think of it in a linear situation. Do you make any, and many beings are also ultra terrestrial. Well, They're, that was my next they, question. The, oh, the, what is, uh, explain the difference between extra and ultra terrestrial. Well, ultra terrestrial beings are beings that don't necessarily come from a different place, if you will, but they come from a different vibrational strip uh, or another dimension. So in other words, there can be extremely humanoid looking beings who simply exist in another, another dimension where their vibrational rate is higher. It's not going to be lower, believe me, where it's higher. And we don't have the uh, facility to perceive matter vibrating at that high level. Um, it's like one of my, one of my, as an example, uh, one of my clients um, who was, again, a lifelong experiencer, had a very uh, close relationship with a being who was extremely humanoid, long red hair, but she called her Angie because she looked like an angel. Her real name was not pronounceable. It was more of a sound. Mm -hmm. So um, when, uh, when my client was a little girl, she said, well, can't you just can't you just take me and show me where your planet is so I can see where it is and what it's like? And Angie said, "Well, we can go to the, you know, to the um, the corollary 
of where my planet would be, but you would not be able to see it because it's actually, you know, vibrating differently. It's in a different um, aspect of, of reality, just as real as this, but you can't perceive it. Your eyes can't perceive it. So this is just stuff I've been told and it makes perfect sense to me. So now ultra terrestrials, I think can also be, um, beings that have evolved uh, into really just spirit forms or etheric forms. And I think many times these beings have been confused for angels, you know, or, or maybe it is an angelic realm. Mm -hmm. Who am I to say, Right. you know, they certainly, there are beings that are as breathtaking and luminous as anything that we learned a catechism about angels, you know, mm -hmm. or wherever we, what, or all faiths have angels. So what, whatever your idea was, there are beings that engage and they again do not interfere, but they will provide support, especially when you're in a dangerous situation or a challenging situation. We, we have, all we have to do is put out, put out the desire for assistance and there are loving beings that will that will come to our side and i hope this doesn't sound corny or religious because i don't mean it to be um uh, but i do think that we we are a culture a global a uh, group of people who have global amnesia we have forgotten who we are we have forgotten through major cataclysms, meteor showers, the Ice Age, the Younger Dryas event. We have simply lost our memory of who and what we are. We are also beings that are capable of incredible uh, non-physical communication and all kinds of stuff. And in fact, I think that that is the commonality. That is what the ETs are really looking for when they are trying to find people to either work with them or communicate. They are looking for human beings that have a high PSI skill. And that is the commonality that I see across the board with the individuals who come to see me. Not only are they having ET encounters, but I can bet you, you know, they saw their, you know, their dead, Grammy or whatever when they were I mean they usually have a huge amount of things that I would just call the shining we say in Irish but the that sensitivity they have it and is it genetic I know that some groups of ETs are very interested in genetic lines well maybe we'll uh, pick and, up on that point when we come back the uh, okay the generational link here with uh, alien or ultra terrestrial encounters Leslie Mitchell Clark is with us back with more of our conversation right after this timeout Financial experts thought we were in the clear. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is... I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. We're back with Leslie Mitchell Clark. And again, let me uh, draw your attention to the Contact and Disclosure Symposium 2024 happening April 20th, just around the corner right here in Toronto, not far from where I'm sitting at the Offworld Bar 
That's on uh, Queen Street in Toronto, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on uh, April the 20th. And um, Mike Patterson, many of these names will be familiar uh, to you, uh, regular Coast to Coast listeners, for example. Mike Patterson has been on uh, from uh, Mm -hmm. Ontario, Sasquatch, and uh, he's been on with uh, my colleague Connie uh, Willis. uh, Oh, yeah, Connie. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) he's been on this podcast as well. Uh, Also, Daniel Sheehan, of course. Uh, and his work in um, exopolitics and and uh, disclosure, and he'll be interviewed by research journalist broadcaster Victor Vigiani. Uh, Colonel Randy Kramer, of course, will be there to talk about the uh, secret space program, and um, uh, he's a you know a super soldier. Uh, we'll we'll talk about a uh, an emerging field called psionics. Uh, that should be fascinating. Again, that's April twentieth at the Offworld Bar, contact and disclosure symposium, uh, dot com for more information and to get tickets. So um, is this, um, by and large, a generational thing that we're talking about when we talk about um, alien encounters and, and, uh, or ultra-terrestrial encounters? Do they tend to be generational? I believe there is a strong indicator that much of the phenomena that is experienced is intergenerational. Um, you know, it's it's a little difficult sometimes to get information out of one's grandparents, or if you're so fortunate, your great grandparents. They they may shut it down, or they may interpret what happened to them as a uh, religious event of some sort, right? So it's um, but. What we do know also, and this is kind of interesting, is that a huge amount of experiencers, I forget what the exact figure is, have O negative blood. Now, I also have O negative blood. I'm the only one in my family as far as I know. And, of course, we know that the five, well, the different blood groups came into being at different times, and science is well aware of when these entrance points happened. But O negative is considered the first human blood type and you know why would we be the only species on the planet that could have a conflicting blood type with a child to the point where your your baby can be recognized as the enemy and be ousted by your own blood system this is completely unique so we do not have many um myself We don't have that rhesus coating around our red blood cells. So it has been speculated that some of the more ancient beings, and I believe we were seeded by a lot of different beings, you know, the five fingers of man, but it's very possible that the the Anunnaki who did most of the upgrading in the sort of a island of Dr. Moreau kind of way, uh, they allegedly also had not only O negative blood, but blood that was based on copper and not iron. So there may be hybrids around who have very unusual blood anomalies, and that's the only evidence that might be left at this point after so many uh, millennia. Do um, many of your clients have talk about hybrid children being shown perhaps their own hybrid children oh yes and this can be extremely emotional um now i have had clients shown children that have a wide scale of humanoid uh characteristics there it seems like some of these experimental children who happened with the grays and again this would be many years ago um are not not human enough to be able to live off the craft um they are sometimes nonverbal. they appear to be unemotional and yet as I've had other people who have been shown children that are so incredibly humanoid that it caused a huge emotional, um, you know, not only bonding, but a grief when these experiencers had to leave those children. So whoever, you know, is responsible, and I'm going to say this is part, would be, would have been part of the Zeta Reticulite. Uh, situation they still don't understand our attachment to family 
and our children. This is still elusive. They also don't fully understand how our our memory works. You know, we haven't been dealing here with infallible beings. Just, you know, just beings who are a little bit farther along on the techno trail. Mm -hmm. So we have to stop feeling so less than. You know, it's also a global inferiority complex, right? These are not infallible beings. Now, it's my feeling and... You know, I've had several uh, vibrant discussions with other regressionists about this, but it's my feeling that no imposed memory block can last forever. Um, And that the majority of them, if they were in fact put in place by some type of U.S. military program, they only last for 20 years, which is why I I believe this points to the reason that so many people in midlife begin having, uh, you know, breakthrough dreams. Um, it, It can't be a coincidence. That means that things are starting to come to the consciousness. And so what we do see in midlife again is more experiences that are that are taking place astrally through astral projection or whatever you wish to call that and we also see um the dissolving of any type of memory suppression which i think has really been put there i'm not going to speak to the u.s i mean to the military motives but i think by the ets it 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 has been an attempt um, to um, save us worry, but in fact, um, not fully understanding how our minds work. Nothing could be worse than the suppression of memories for us. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about um, screen memories and how someone, mm. someone may have a, a memory that doesn't make sense uh, and it turns out to be a kind of staging or a screen memory. Yeah. Explain what yeah. screen memories are, and maybe we can you can talk about some of the more, I don't know, common shared okay. screen memories that people have that have had encounters. All right, I certainly will. Now, this is a very, very common uh, phenomena, and it's a kind of projected telepathy that some ETs can use that is so powerful they can actually create an artificial environment out of light matter or whatever's around so this screen memories are used to allay fear generally speaking Uh, a good example would be many many people who have been taken on craft and have gone to some type of launching pad or base have the screen memory that they've gone to Pearson, to the airport, Mm. or, you know, wherever. That would be a very common one. Um, The, uh, let me just tell you this little story. This will illustrate it so well. They're also used, screen memories are used an awful lot for children, again, to allay their fears. So this is a, this is a story about Wes. And honestly, I don't remember if it's in the book or not, but it's certainly one that he told me under hypnosis. So, um, Wes was about 12 years old, something like that. And he was getting to that kind of surly age that young boys get to where they just become gruesome. You know, he was he was about there, okay? <laughs> so he was starting to resist being taken. And at that time, it was always physical. It was always being levitated out the window or through the roof or taken to the backyard. I mean, it was always physical. So in this particular uh, instance, he was transported out and he was taken to a, a screen memory, a set that looked like it was supposed to be a children's party. And he said that all the children were placed in a circle. Some of them he recognized. Some of them appeared to be completely unconscious. Some of them just appeared to be high or stoned. You know, it was a varying degrees of, of, of consciousness, but he was like wide awake. So he was in this environment. And um, now it was, it became clear that it was a, it, it was a screen memory constructed so that they could d- conduct a n- non-painful physical examinations of the kids that they had assembled so now here's a case where again uh they didn't do quite enough research so eventually at a certain point um um 
an entity came out of a side door with like an exaggerated doctor's coat on and one of those funny lights or magnifying lights. You don't see that anymore. Right, you know what right. I'm talking about? Um, and a clown mask. Now, onophobia is one of the top fears. M many people are terrified of clowns. So as soon as this being came out with the clown mask on, everyone went nuts. Wes turned over the table and started yelling at the beings. And then within five seconds, he was dropped on his bed from like an uncomfortable height. Mm. <laughs> so there you had a screen memory that, that really was on the verge of, uh, of decomposing because, because they used very poor judgment in picking a clown mask to disguise whatever the being was that was going to examine them. And um, let's see if I... Now, they also use, um, and this has happened uh, again a while ago when the taking of sperm and ova was part of the process, they have also used screen memories to convince someone that they are actually having sex with a living being that looks like them or you know, a humanoid living being and then at some point during the process someone wakes up and they've got like a machine on them mm. you know and it's so this kind of so extreme emotions can dissolve the screen memory i guess is my point if enough anxiety happens the whole thing will just evaporate and that'll be the end of it so we do see that we see it all the time and especially with children, as I mentioned. Um, implants, is that still a thing or is that kind of a throwback again to the, the Eisenhower Truman mm. Treaty with, uh, with the Greys? Well, you know, I think we have to first get it into our minds that, that implants are not tracking dots. Everyone has a unique brain signature. And no evolved ET has ever needed a tracking dot to find exactly who they wish to find. So what I have heard from my clients and what I believe to be true is what we're really talking about are some forms of what I would call step up transformers, some devices that are actually designed to stimulate psychic ability. And, uh, and that they are benign. Some of them are meant to last for just a short time and you, you can sneeze them out like the ones that are little balls. They eventually just, they come right out. Some of them are, are meant to be um, uh, in for a lengthy amount of time. Uh, some of them can move away from the surgeon who's trying to remove them. I mean, Dr. Lear, who's mm. passed, sadly, he was the leading expert in the removal um, and the examination of implants. So we've seen all, all kinds, and some of them dissolve as soon as they are exposed to the atmosphere. It's very hard to get a, a, an analysis is what I'm trying to say. They either disintegrate or they you can't get them. Um, now, um, I did some work with um, a gentleman you may know named Sid Goldberg. He's now a producer with Gaia mm -hmm. TV, but we were working for a while on a, a television idea together and he found a gal who had an implant that was so perceptible under the skin that it was magnetic in other words you could put you know a, me a metallic object and it would just stick to the outside of the arm right so they knew it wasn't some type of random thing now i don't know how he ever arranged to have this done but but he found a surgeon who removed the implant and also had it analyzed with a, a, a the mass spectrometer is that what they call it in csi right mass spectrometer so. Yeah. so um the implant was removed and it looked like um two little barbells Mm -hmm. with a small with you know with a small cord between them very unusual look not, nothing that would have ever formed in the body is that advisable to remove them is that advisable is it dangerous i don't think it's dangerous at all i don't think it's dangerous at all because i think by the time you feel it or if you feel it it's done its job mm. right now this one had been in this girl 
remembered she well what my job was i i took her back to the moment of implant and she was about five years old and i think this implant had something to do with her father was a big wig with the cia and she traveled from air military base to military base i don't think this was necessarily et intervention exclusively at any rate it was implanted when she was about five and had sort of moved to the surface i suppose um now when when it was analyzed certainly there was an amount of uh you know calcified tissue on it because it, of where it had been but also there were metals that were completely unidentifiable in our atomic spectrum there was there was material there that was not recognized by the mass spectrometer and that's saying something so um that is the only personal in, uh encounter I have with someone who has actually had it removed and when it was being implanted uh, there were humanoids around when I regressed her and I don't remember the presence of any ETs particularly so I think you know anything that we do with reverse engineering is going to be a little bit clumsy and a little bit effed up <laughs> you know if you can go by our our modus operandi throughout world our world history right that's you know that's the deal so um uh, i know that captain randy i mean colonel randy kramer will have a lot would have a lot more to say about this and as far as how early intervention can begin because he believes that um he 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 actually was enhanced genetically um when he was in vitro very soon after he was conceived although his mother has no memory of that but again we have people whose family were in the military a lot of access and um and randy kramer is a very tall he's like six four i mean this is the kind of guy that you would probably want as a super soldier really smart and really fit and really tall so is that something that they achieved? Is it his own genetics? I'll let him speak to that. And he will be speaking to that perhaps at uh, the Contact and Disclosure Symposium 2024 happening April 20th, just around the corner at the Offworld Bar in Toronto, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. April 20th for tickets. Uh, and more information, go to contactanddisclosuresymposium.com. The link is right there in the episode notes. Just click on it. It'll take you right there. And uh, hypnotherapist, regressionist, author, Leslie Mitchell Clark with us. Thank you so much, Leslie. Great connecting with you again. I appreciate Aww. all your time. Bless your heart, Richard. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a new book, which is going to be called Midwives of Disclosure. Uh -huh. And that means people like you, people like me, all of us who are working together to, to bring about awareness to uh, our fellow humanoids. So uh, that's coming up in the next year or so. So listen, you take great care. You too. Come on down to the event. I'll buy you a lot of drinks. <laughs> <laughs> the bar will be open from 10 a.m. on, by the way. Wow. <laughs> so Okay. Well, you know, I'm Irish. What I, I got, I got to do it. I got to <laughs> roll that way. Plus, we're gonna have a fabulous lunch. And if you are a vegan or 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 gluten sensitive, there's gonna be stuff for everybody. I'm gonna make sure of it. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Richard. Thank All right. you. Bye bye. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.
Hey there, friends. Welcome to another installment of Strange Planets. And if you'd like to get deeper into Strange Planet and you want to follow me down the rabbit hole, it's uh, highly recommended that you become a premium subscriber. And it's real easy to do. Just click on the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. You gain access to commercial-free listening, special bonus episodes that are produced exclusively for premium subscribers and you receive my monthly newsletter inner sanctum all right on this episode did a highly advanced civilization exist in prehistory is the giza pyramid a remnant of their technology then what was the power source that fueled such a civilization the technology of harmonic resonance claims renowned master craftsman and engineer Christopher Dunn. In a brilliant piece of reverse engineering based on 20 years of research, Christopher reveals that the Giza Pyramid of uh, Giza, or the, sorry, the Great Pyramid of Giza was actually a large acoustical device, but its size and dimensions, by its size and dimensions, this crystal edifice created a harmonic resonance with the earth and converted earth's vibrational energies to microwave radiation. Christopher Dunn has an extensive background as a craftsman, starting his career as an indentured apprentice in his hometown of Manchester, England. Recruited by an aerospace manufacturing company, he immigrated to the United States in 1969. Over the past 49 years, Chris has worked at every level of high-tech manufacturing, from machinist, toolmaker, programmer, and operator of high-power industrial lasers, project engineer, and laser operations manager. Chris's Pyramid Odyssey began in 1977 after he read Peter Tompkins' book, Secrets of the Great Pyramid. His immediate reaction after uh, learning of the Great Pyramid's precision and design characteristics was to consider that this edifice may have had an original purpose that differed from conventional opinion. After further research and study of source material on various theories, Chris concluded that it must have originally been built to provide a highly technical society with energy. In short, it was a very large machine. Discovering of the uh, purpose of this machine and documenting his case has taken the better part of 20 years of research. And following the 1998 publication of Chris's book, The Giza Power Plant, Technologies of Ancient Egypt, which describes a holistic energy device that is harmonically coupled with the Earth and its inhabitants. Chris's second book, entitled Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, Advanced Engineering in the Temples of the Pharaohs, was published by Inner Traditions in uh, June of 2010. And uh, his latest is Giza, The Tesla Connection, Acoustical Science and the Harvesting of Clean Energy. Let me just hold that up there for my YouTube and Rumble viewers. Christopher Dunn, welcome to Strange Planet. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Great to have you here. All right. So um, let's just back up a little bit and talk about um, the Giza Power Plant book. And um, just uh, talk to me a little bit about what uh, this technology of harmonic resonance, what what does that mean? Break that down for us in simple terms. Well, a vibration actually is the foundation of existence, really, when you consider it, that everything is in motion and everything is vibration, whether it's mechanical vibration or electrical vibration. Uh, vibration is the uh, is basically what drives the universe. Um, and the cycles of the planets and uh, everything, everything has kind of like a a harmonic relationship. Uh, And as we are finding out, that harmonic relationship is uh, is consistent, not just uh, in the macro system of the universe, but also even down to our uh, DNA, human DNA. And the, uh, the frequencies that we find within the human body if they are uh, transposed up uh, into the range of human hearing, um, you can you have uh, frequencies that match 
the resonance, some of the frequencies in the Great Pyramid, particularly in the King's Chamber. Um, the energy produced by the human body. You mean like the, the uh, sometimes we refer to that as the Taurus field or um, like our aura, that, that type of energy? Uh, I'm talking, well, I mean, that <clears throat> is uh, an extension, I believe, of the, uh, the driving force of, of humans. But the, I'm talking about the frequencies of the, the DNA, mm. uh, human DNA. Uh, there was a study done by Dr. David Deemer uh, who had mapped the frequencies of human DNA, which of course were uh, extremely high, way above the range of human hearing. Um, and a composer uh, on the West Coast, he's currently living in Oregon, I believe, oh no, California, uh, <clears throat> Susan Alex Jander, uh, she took those frequencies and uh, brought them into the range of human hearing and composed music based on those frequencies. So <clears throat> the, uh, the Great Pyramid is well known to reflect the dimensions of the, of the Earth uh, in terms of the polar radius and the, uh, the equatorial radius. The... Uh, <clears throat> The existence of uh, the Pythagorean triangle, uh, pi and phi, in the in the Great Pyramid has been noted. Uh, also, the golden triangle. There are many different relationships within the Great Pyramid that people have determined uh, existed. Now, the uh, the question obviously becomes, if you are a bit of a skeptic, is that coincidental or was it intentional? And after the Giza power plant was published, um, I received a, an email from a uh, physicist, uh, Dr. Dustin Carr, and he had read my book and found it stimulating and also had started to perform his own studies of the dimensions of the uh, the king's chamber and also other features of the great pyramid and started to draw those relationships and uh, concluded uh, or offered as a preliminary conclusion uh, until further studies on site that the Egyptians uh, could have been in possession of advanced knowledge of non-linear acoustics and and from what he told me the non-linear acoustics is uh is a is something that we are we are just in our infancy in in actually understanding everything about it uh, so there's a lot more to be learned. I, I obviously am not qualified to take that aspect of the research further, but uh, <clears throat> I was able to engage with a, um, a sound engineer and uh, we did some uh, acoustic tests inside the Great Pyramid and uh, he wrote a, a, um, an appendix for my book uh, on the acoustics of the Great Pyramid. So the acoustics is a big part of it. And then, of course, that comes back to harmonics. It comes back to frequencies. And uh, it also relates back to what I wrote in the Giza power plant about the function of uh, uh, the uh, Grand Gallery and how it served to uh, collect, to receive vibrations, convert them to airborne sound and focus them in the king's chamber. Um, you mentioned acoustics, and I, I don't know if, um, I can't remember the name of the uh, the author, um, but he was talking about, I, I think this field is called cymatics, where you uh, he went into the king's chamber and he placed some kind of a membrane um, over <laughs> like a drum. And yeah. again, using the, I guess, the resonant uh, frequency or the acoustics in the chamber, uh, when he vibrated that membrane, and, and there were there was sand uh, on the on the membrane, and it formed um, a hieroglyphic. Uh, yes, uh, it, uh, his name was uh, John Reed, 
and uh, he's uh, fairly well known in, in the pyramid research in the pyramid research field and uh, I think he has I forget the name of his, his uh, booklet that he wrote about it but uh, it's very interesting yeah. that phenomenon that he noted because he did the same thing I believe in a cathedral in um, in Ireland and um, same thing cymatics a membrane over a drum with sand and it formed I guess what they call those um, a Celtic chord like the um, the Irish yeah. um, letters it formed a Celtic chord I mean that that's just, just yes I mean the field of it's, it's, I mean the field is called archaeo acoustics and uh, there are several uh, major players in that field uh, and they're at, uh, eminently more qualified than I am uh, to do that research, and they're coming up with some remarkable thing. I think Paul Devereaux is another person who uh, is working in that field. So it's uh, it's fascinating. My focus uh, on the Great Pyramid was uh, c coming at it from more of a mechanical perspective and uh, trying to... Uh, trying to discover what everything about that particular structure and how it functioned and why certain things existed, uh, why th certain things exist today, what could have existed in the past and uh, the process that was going on. So I, I was looking at it from a a system perspective in terms of there are, there are different subsystems within the entire the entire <clears throat> power plant or I, I I kind of I'm calling it a, an electron harvester these days because that's I think more accurate a description of it an electron you know, where, harvester interesting yeah and and there is new information that has uh, I introduce in in, in the book that is related to uh, the function of the, uh, of the of the Great Pyramid, but also um, it gives us a an idea of what might be possible in the future for the uh, to as a solution to solve our own energy problems, and that is the uh, the work of uh, Dr. Friedem and Freund, who is a, was a physicist with NASA, and he was doing research on earthquake lights. Uh, yeah, I want to come back to that, but I want to just ask you um, a couple other questions, I guess, going back to the uh, the first book, the Giza Power Plant Technologies of Ancient Egypt. If it is, in fact, the Great Pyramid, uh, a large acoustical device, uh, you're saying that it was a crystal edifice. Um, explain. I mean, we don't see... Or do we? Do we see evidence that it was, in fact, crystal? Uh, that that was that is a blurb, uh, the publisher's blurb. I, I didn't. Ah. I, I don't describe it as a crystal edifice. Ah. Okay. I mean, it is a it is a collection of uh, sedimentary and igneous rock, uh, very precisely crafted and joined together, but still, uh, and. You know, as you look at it, you may say that that there are certain crystalline properties to those rocks, but the uh, you know it depends on how you define what a crystal is. You know, uh, <clears throat> we wouldn't look at the Great Pyramid and say that's a giant crystal. Which uh, a lot of people have said, well, it's just a jumble of rocks. But uh, I think it's a little hyperbole in a way. Okay, fair enough to say that. But were th I mean, when you look at the the construction and how the the various chambers and the passageway passageways inside the the the, the pyramid are right. are positioned and constructed, I mean, what uh, what does that tell you in terms of its its purpose? How does that reveal its purpose? Well, the first the first thing, uh, if you go back to you know what the what is the what was my foundational thinking uh, and philosophy uh, entering into this research? Uh, I mean, you know, going back to the beginning, I would say that um, I was reading 
Peter Tompkins' book, The uh, Secrets of the Great Pyramid. And as I was reading it and learning about the Great Pyramid and how it was the most precise building on the planet and some of the... Uh, some of the facts about how how precise it was, such as the casing stones being cut within ten thousandths of an inch over seventy five inches, uh, seventy five square inches. It's, I mean, this is uh, this is like modern day craftsmanship being conducted by in a period of time where they were sup supposed to just have copper tools and sticks and stones to, uh, you know, they used to bash their rock into shape. So, so when I, I, I considered that, and you look at the size of the Great Pyramid, uh, you have a, a structure that weighs six million, almost six million tons, and it's uh, 481 feet high, uh, 13, it covers 13 acres, and the, 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 the acres were leveled within seven eighths of an inch. Um, uh, an unbelie unbelievable precision. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, even the the angle of the pyramid, um, when you uh, it, it, when you you can calculate the height to the perimeter to to equal pi, and then you have the uh, some of the details on the inside, such as the uh, descending passage, which was. Uh, crafted or and assembled to within twenty thousandths of an inch of being absolutely straight. Twenty thousandths of an inch is the thickness of a thumbnail. To give you some reference, uh, that's where you sit back and start uh, thinking. That, well, something was going on here because we do not <clears throat> require those kind of tolerances when we're building modern buildings. You know. Uh, I mean, I talked to a civil engineer. And I said, "Well, what is the uh, what is the code right now for foundations in terms of how how level they need to be?" And uh, he said, "Well, they would need to be the, the code is about twenty thousandths of an inch per foot. So that's the thickness of a thumbnail per foot of being level. So if you extend that across the." the uh, 13 acres, the, the the Great Pyramid could have been off 15 inches, right? Right. And, and, it's, with, and it's within seven eighths of an inch. So, you know, that that kind of makes you scratch your head and go, wow, that's, that's significant. But the, <clears throat> even going on, on the inside, the, uh, the, the limestone, but that uh, makes up the like the Queen's Chamber, the Grand Gallery. Uh, it's all finely fitted, so you couldn't even uh, slip a a piece of paper in between the joints, right? And there's no no mortar between them, uh, <clears throat> and it's it's just so perfectly fitted that I I came to the and then. It's not just that, but even the way it looks, if you look at a cross-section of the, the Great Pyramid, you're looking at a, the schematics of a machine. Uh, the, 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 uh, the passageways are a 26 and a half degree angle. Uh, the Grand Gallery is about 26 and a half degree angle. And then you've got the chambers, and then you've got these four shafts that shoot off in different directions. And it all has the uh, the look of a machine and not a tomb. Uh, <clears throat> and then when you consider that there have been no tombs, no original burial found in, in pyramids in Egypt, then um, it, it leaves that question open as to if not a tomb, then what what was it what was it used for? You, so I concluded it looked looked like the machine, it had the precision of machine, only on the scale of acres, rather, you know, it was a, a very large machine. Uh, you, and, uh, yeah. um, you know, if we were to invest our, our uh, resources into building such a, such a, uh, <clears throat> a building, uh, what would, what would we do it for? Um, 
generally our largest uh, industrial projects are used for uh, creating energy when you consider the size of power plants and stuff like that. I mean, we invest a, a lot of money into uh, building power plants. So I'm, I'm fascinated by the description uh, you, you, you made earlier, um, uh, an electron collector. You described harvester, the, yeah, yeah. So, or sorry, uh, uh, electron harvester. Oh, it's just uh, no, it's a collector. You're right. Okay. Either way. So, um, in in its harmonizing seismic energy and attenuating the accumulated accumulating stresses, meaning um, tech, plate tectonics, we're talking about here. Well, seismic uh, seismic uh, stresses in, in the plates. Yes, yeah, so as they. Uh, as these plates push together, they build up stresses, and which eventually will lead to an earthquake. So, and it's it's speculative. I mean, everything is speculative, of course. right? Uh, it's a possibility that it was serving many different uh, functions for the, for the builders. That it was harmonizing the the planet. Uh, it was creating energy. It was in tune with the uh, human organism uh, in terms of the uh, frequencies. And so therefore, it was uh, providing a, uh, not just power for devices, any devices that may, they may have had uh, back then, but um, it was also uh, creating a, an environment that was supportive of the uh, of, of uh, biological system, the bio, but the biosphere. Christopher, we'll take a quick time out back with more of our conversation. Giza, the Tesla connection right here on Strange Planet. Don't go away. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So, Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Christopher Dunn is with us. Giza, the Tesla connection, acoustical science and the harvesting of clean energy. So uh, if it's harvesting electrons, uh, how does it, how does it capture and store them? I, the, uh, first of all, we have to go to the source. Uh, so we say, okay, if it's capturing electrons, where are the electrons coming from? Uh, in the Giza power plant, I presented a model that uh, identified the, the silicon quartz crystal in the King's Chamber as being the source of piezoelectric uh, piezoelectricity that uh, stimulated uh, hydrogen that entered the uh, the chamber. Uh, <clears throat> since then, I there has been some resistance to that idea. One of the uh, objections to it is that uh, in order to for piezoelec piezoelectric electricity to flow, uh, a crystal has to be stressed across a particular axis. And because the, the, uh, the quartz crystal in granite is randomly oriented, that uh, it, it could not be guaranteed that you would get that much power out of it. That's number one. The second one, 
The second objection was in 2018, I was in Egypt with a geologist, um, and his name was Adrian Lungan, and he was examining the, uh, the granite uh, at Aswan, and also the, the, uh, the Great Pyramid and around, around the Giza Plateau. And uh, his opinion was that, that what I had written in my book was, uh, was wrong in terms of the percentage of the quartz crystal. Uh, I had, I had uh, used a reference from another book that said that it was 55% quartz crystal in the, uh, in the granite, Aswan granite. And he said that he thought that it was probably less than 20% rather than 55%. So that was that, that was two strikes against the whole piezoelectric theory. So coming away from from uh, from that uh, from Egypt in 2018, there there was I had a a research partner. His name was uh, Bob Water. He was the uh, sound guy, the sound engineer. And and uh, I must say that it, I, I regret to say that he passed away last year mm. uh, in September, which uh, which is a, a great loss. But um, he uh, he did some remarkable work, and he also did some research and came across um, Freedom and Freund. Well, the, the really the really neat thing is is that. Um, he lived really close to uh, where Friedemann and Freund lived. Dr. Friedemann and Freund is a German physicist who worked uh, at NASA. And uh, <clears throat> Friedemann had been uh, doing research into earthquake lights. And so he, he wasn't satisfied with just looking at the lights and speculating on it. He wanted to, to know what the underlying physics of the phenomenon was. Uh, he he kind of dismissed um, the piezoelectric effect in terms of uh, providing the answer to the questions he had, but uh, uh, he he dug deeper and started to do his own experiments. Um, but his objective was to, or his hope was that. He, uh, where he would be able to identify the physics of what was the, the natural occurrences in the lithosphere that caused these earthquake lights. Uh, and if we was able to do that, they would be able to predict when an earthquake was going to happen because the, what ultimately he determined was it's the, the lights show up uh, 10 days before an earthquake, and they may continue for days afterwards. But they are detected by satellites uh, that are trained on the, on, on the Earth and, and picking up these infrared signals. And so, and then, of course, you know, local uh, reports of, uh, of earthquake lights showing up in the hillside. So essentially, what he uh, det what he found out was that the the uh, there were per what he calls peroxy defects in the minerals in in uh, igneous rock, and uh, they are like dormant electronic charge carriers, and when they're put under stress, uh, they will shoot to the surface, and it's like a a positive hole electron. That will shoot to the surface and join with a uh, with a, a negative electron, uh, and then they kind of ionize the air. But they should shoot to the highest point of, on the surface. It's not not just the lowest point, like in a valley. They will shoot up to up into the hillside. That's where that's why these earthquake lights are seen in the hilly parts of of. Uh, like Mount Shasta and, ah, other and people confuse them for here. UFOs and people confuse them for UFOs. They, they well, I'm not going to say that they're confused. Anybody's confused. They, they, uh, I'm just going to say that's a phenomenon that people observe. Right. You know? However, the, however they determine them. So, so he, sorry. So he, just so I'm following along here, um, yeah. the, the, the earthquake lights are created by the, the stress, um, of the tectonic plates below ground. So 
the Egyptians, inspired by that, were figuring out how to stress the igneous uh, rocks inside the pyramid to create the same phenomenon, the, the, the flow of electrons? Uh, no, I think what the Egyptians were doing, they, they were they were stimulating the movements uh, in the lithosphere. So they were driving vibrations into the earth to ah. stress the rock so that they would release the electron. Got it. Those electrons would then shoot to the surface and they would be naturally drawn to the, uh, the pyramids because they would be the highest they're like man-made mountains and they're sitting on the surface and they would naturally go go to the uh the pyramids and, and you know there was a study in i think 2018 a russian group uh determined that electromagnetic energy uh travels through a pyramid the great pyramid it would focus in the center around the king's chamber mm -hmm. so that's quite remarkable uh uh, confirmation. Um, one of the uh, the big hints uh, that this is what they were used for and what was going on is um, was it scorching or some kind of charring on the ceiling of the king's chamber? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you know one of the things about you know when when you're trying to put pieces together uh, from little little scraps of evidence that you that you read about here and there. Uh, everything is important. And, you know, I kind of separate them into categories. It's, it's like there are, there are things that exist in the Great Pyramid that were not intended by the original builders or the original designers. Uh, there are things uh, that existed because of the operation of the... Uh, of the of the pyramid uh of the, the the entire system and then there are you know objects that are combined may be a combination of both you know not intended uh maybe supplement to it but not necessary not necessary uh and some stuff could have been brought in many years later so you have modern contamination of evidence, and then you have the you go back to the original uh, original artifact. Uh, and in the pyramid, you have the many different changes in the the materials that you that you see. The uh, uh, in order to start to talk about the scorch marks on the grand gallery. I, I should probably go back to the the Queen's Chamber uh, because it's important uh, that we talk about that first, and and that is that in order to, in order to the, the evidence that I used to support the theory that it was a maser uh, <clears throat> is because of the dimensions of the northern shaft. Uh, that match the frequency of hydrogen, and then the condition of the shafts in the Queen's Chamber below, uh, and the existence of uh, chemical substances uh, within that chamber, and the buildup of salt on the walls, uh, <clears throat> and also the other different features like the, uh, the what they call the Gantenbrink store, the shafts. Uh, the uh, the metal pins that exist at the end of these shafts, why they were closed off at the uh, the uh, the end, uh, you know, where you, they were closed off at the chamber and and closed off at the end. So, the intention was not to provide air into that chamber, but I I propose that they uh, were feeding chemicals into the chamber, and the chemicals uh, were mixing and uh, creating hydrogen. So the <clears throat> the hydrogen then filled the filled the uh, the inside of the Great Pyramid. In the in the King's Chamber, uh, it was as it traveled through the Great Pyramid, with the action of acoustics and also the uh, electron flow, the, the it it was uh, 
the energy of the hydrogen increased, and so the electrons are pumped to a higher, higher uh, uh, energy state. When it enters the the king's chamber, that's where the magic happens, and an input signal comes in from the north shaft, uh, and it gathers the energy from the hydrogen and exits the uh, the southern shaft. Now, the evidence to support that is the northern shaft itself, and it's a complicated bends. Uh, uh, and also recent discoveries that uh, have been made, such as the large void, which uh, was uh, speculated to have ser been serving as a, as a pre-amplifier for the, the, uh, the microwaves. And then in the, the south wall of the king's chamber, there's this uh, kind of bulbous opening that looks like a microwave horn antenna. And so all of that stuff kind of ties it, ties everything in, that you have, you have a, a, a microwave beam coming in from the, the north shaft. It crosses the chamber directly opposite where, where it enters the chamber is this microwave horn antenna. It collects energy from the high, the energized hydrogen within the chamber and then exits through the southern shaft. So, but it, that's just one aspect of it. Now, when you come to explain the scorch marks on the ceiling of the, the Grand Gallery, uh, the other evidence that I examined was the, uh, the evidence for a, a disturbance of the, this, the king's chamber. It, it uh, had expanded over uh, a half an inch, maybe about an inch, and the beams, the granite beams uh, above, had cracked. Like an explosion. We're talking about an and, explosion. Right. So I speculated, I said, well, uh, this, this w would have happened if uh, there was a cataclysm, uh, a media strike, or things just got out of control. Um, and then everything started to shake apart. Uh, the system was breached. Oxygen entered into the chamber, a spark, yeah. and, and then... You're filling this you thing have... with hydrogen. Hydrogen. Uh, I mean, it's like the Hindenburg, potentially. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's... Uh, it, yes, but it's a closed system. And so as long as you don't have... Uh, as long as you don't have hydrogen coming in, uh, you know, mix... Or, or you don't have oxygen mixing with the hydrogen... You've, you've got a, a stable system, but as soon as you introduce hydrogen into it, then it, uh, you, you, you know, it has the potential to explode, which uh, my theory is that it did. And, um, and the other part of the, the, the machine was a series of resonators in the Grand Gallery. Those resonators were... Uh, were feeding acoustic energy into the chamber to cause cause it to vibrate, <clears throat> and so uh, with that that energy going going into the chamber and driving the driving the orbit of the electrons and the hydrogen higher and higher, uh, then then you have that maser activity, but. What, you know, is, what do you mean a, by maser? Like, uh, last question, and then we'll go to another break. But what do you mean by maser activity? Okay, well, you, we all know what a laser is, yeah, right? Yes. Okay, so a laser is light amplification through stimulated emission radiation. Maser was the, the uh, precursor to the, the laser. It was microwave amplification through stimulated emission. Just a different uh, frequency uh, on the... Uh, so it's like a, uh, it's not light, but it's microwaves. And where were they getting, frequency. where were they getting the microwaves to, s s you know, send in through these chambers and these passageways, send into this edifice? Where did they get the microwaves? The, uh, well, the, we are being bombarded with them daily. It's the, uh, Atomic hydrogen in the universe delivers to the Earth a microwave signal of, uh, with a wavelength of 21 centimeters. So its uh, wavelength of hydrogen is uh, 8.309. And the, the width of the northern shaft coming into the chamber is uh, 8.4. 
uh, and the height is 4.8. So a suitable waveguide for a microwave signal would be uh, the height or the, the, you know, it would be a rectangle uh, where the height is about approximately half the width. Wow. Um, <laughs> Talk about advanced. Uh, Christopher, <laughs> a, a quick time out back with, uh, there's so much to discuss, so little time. Giza, the Tesla connection, acoustical science, and the harvesting of clean energy. Christopher Dunn stays with us. Don't go away. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. There's the new one from Christopher Dunn, Giza, the Tesla connection. Um, is, is everything that was required uh, for the Giza, the Great Pyramid to be a power plant, is it still there or were the, some, the inner, important inner workings removed or what do you imagine you know, it looked like in there? Uh, yes, I, I, um, I think what we what we have is just the skeleton of, of the system, like the whole country, uh, <clears throat> and all the monuments and the temples and all the pyramids. It's like it's the skeleton of a, a very highly advanced civilization, and much of it has been removed. Um, and now you know they're talking about the uh, the time period when such a civilization might have existed uh, was it was it before at the end of the ice age before the ice age uh, was ten thousand years ago thirty thousand years ago uh, we don't know but uh, uh, I think most researchers now and even some Egyptians are now looking at even their own um, historical records that speak of a, a more ancient time in Egypt. And so <clears throat> it makes sense when you consider how much is not there that you would anticipate to be there as an infrastructure to support even the building of a great pyramid. Uh, the infrastructure to build that just does not exist in Egypt. There are no no tools in the ancient Egyptian toolbox that uh, would be capable of doing just a, a small fraction of what we see. Not just the uh, the sheer weight of the, the rocks and the, the amount of the rocks that they were, were actually cutting, but the exactness and the precision that uh, they, and the geometries that they were that they were creating in very, very hard igneous rock. So it's it's clear to most people now, uh, growingly, the Egyptians themselves, that their civilization uh, goes much further back, much further back from the ancient Egyptians to a, a higher, a technically uh, evolved civilization. Um, and uh, yeah. go ahead. And uh, <clears throat> you know the the thing is is that the door to 
that particular view of ancient e e Egypt has been opened. And the Egyptians themselves are now taking charge, and they will take this research further and rewrite their own history. Um, the uh, the capstones that are missing on the pyramids, or the uh, pyramidians, what role do yeah. you suspect did they play in this power plan, and what do you think they might have been made of? There's uh, been different speculations on that. Um, if you if I go by uh, Freud's model, and this is where the uh, the Tesla connection comes in, because on the Great Pyramid, uh, we've talked about the interior and how it may have functioned as uh, to uh, create a microwave energy and deliver it uh, through the southern shaft. Uh, that that does not address just the. Uh, the Freund, what they call the Freund effect, and the release of electrons from the lithosphere. And so when you consider the electrons that are now flowing through the Great Pyramid, not all of them are going to be uh, entrained in a microwave beam and shot through the southern shaft. Uh, the vast majority of them, I would speculate, uh, would flow through the Great Pyramid, and uh, if the pyramid had a attachment point uh, where, that would create a circuit, then they would flow to that attachment point. Or there could be multiple attachment points. So where these uh, positive hole electrons will now flow and, uh, and meet with a, a, a negative electron. And so what you have uh, is a... Uh, something that is equal to uh, and reflects what the uh, what Freund was uh, was experimenting with in his laboratory because this is not this is is beyond just being theoretical now it's not theoretical it's actually a proven fact uh, Freund uh, Freund's uh, physics works he uh, he did the experiments in his lab at NASA. He had a granite beam uh, that he put in a hydraulic press. Uh, <clears throat> he pressed down on one end, and he capped the other with a, a copper cap and, and put an electric lead from the cap, the copper cap to the other, the where the uh, the hydraulic press was pressing down, and and electrons indeed flowed uh, along the beam. Uh, they flowed up through the wire. So he pressed down on one end, and the electrons flowed. He measured the flow. The, uh, <clears throat> and his papers are freely available on the web for people to uh, read if they just do a, uh, a Google search uh, for Freedom and Freund. Uh, just put in Freund, F-R-E-U-N-D, earthquake lights, or E-Q-L. Um, you can uh, read about his research. He also has a, a YouTube video, which is uh, quite excellent. Uh, he did a presentation to uh, in Christchurch, New Zealand. I think it was in 2016 on earthquake lights. It was a TEDx talk. And and he delivers it in a uh, in a manner that is uh, you know, very understandable to a layperson like me, uh, and so you know he's uh, he did the work. Uh, he proved his he proved his uh, his uh, uh, physics to be correct. He called it a new physics and a new discovery. And, but he, he was hoping that he would be able to convince the geolog the, the seismologist of the geological survey to uh, adopt the methods for detection of earthquakes. So far, they have not hmm. have chosen not to do that, from my understanding. Just back to the capstones or the pyramidians. What do you, what do you think they were made Oh, of? yes, back to them. So um, we do, have, I mean, there is a capstone in the, in the Cairo Museum. Uh, it looks like it's made out of diorite or basalt or something, so like a black black granite uh, capstone. The one uh, 
the one on the Great Pyramid is no longer there, so we can only speculate what that was made out of. But if you look at the pyramid next to it, the uh, second pyramid, Khafre's Pyramid, you see that the capstone is uh, it's still intact. So, uh, and it was made out of limestone. So I I'm, I I don't know. Uh, some people speculate that it had a it was made out of gold, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and but you can speculate all you want. I would say that at least in order for Freud's uh, uh, Freud's physics to work, then you would have something probably made out of uh, gold or copper, uh, even if you had a limestone or a uh, or a granite capstone. How were they? Um, so they were, they were using this as a power plant. How were they transmitting this power? Was it essentially they were transmitting electricity? Uh, yes, for to, for that we we have to be a little futuristic in our in our thinking, right? And so, one of the problems, uh, one of the sad sad things, in my opinion, is that. Um, Nikola Tesla was never allowed or he didn't receive the funding to complete his research on the wireless delivery of, of electricity. And so in my book, I talk about uh, his research in Ward and Clifton, which his intention was to, uh, to deliver. He had, you know, if you look at Ward and Cliff Tower, it's like a, a huge frame, a dome. Yeah, I've been where there. That it, it fed elect- electricity into it, and it was radiated out into the atmosphere. And uh, with the pyramids, you have the same thing. So <clears throat> it's radiating out into the atmosphere, and then following Tesla's vision, which uh, we could only pick up scraps of it right now, we would say that he could, uh, you know, you could further that research and uh, and d- devise means to collect uh, that electricity remotely without wires. All the That's, pyramids, all the pyramids were designed as power plants, or just G- the Great Pyramid of Giza. Well, Richard, I, I'm just focused on the Great Pyramid, but I would say, I, I'd say, and I say in my book very strongly, that the entire Giza Plateau, that was a system, it was not, uh, you can't uh, separate one from the other. You can't say, okay, this was, a, uh, this was an electron harvester and that one over there, uh, they stored grain in, you know, for the pharaohs, it's, uh, or, you know, some other kind of uh, function i would say it was all it, the the whole area just uh it it just speak it speaks of energy it's it's a very energetic spot to be so with this kind of power generation what do you think ancient i mean we may be going back further than we think of in terms of ancient egypt but what was this civilization like did they have potentially like electric vehicles uh, i don't know high speed trains <laughs> Do they need trains? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's a good question. Uh, you know, it, it's how do how do we get there from here? Mm. And and the, the thing is, is that you have to you have to have some kind of uh, vision. It's like if we look if we if we look at what we're surrounded with now and how we how we work how we function, and and then go back in our minds fifty years or. So, in my case, 78 years, (laughs) than to see what we had then. You know, it's like this is a different world entirely. Uh, Entirely. I mean, the culture has changed, technology has changed, it's advanced exponentially. Uh, It's unbelievable. And yet we're still transmitting electricity the same way we've we've been doing so for over 100 years. Well, yes. (laughs) And that's one of the that's one of the points that I make in my book is that even though we've made you know quantum leaps in advancement on on the how electrons move within a device to you know cause function, 
uh, the methods we are using to deliver those electrons to the device haven't changed in over 100 years, which is, you know, it's kind of like, hey, come on, guys, catch up. <laughs> I, and, you know, the other, the other uh, subject that I, I touch on in the book is uh, when it comes to uh, envisioning what, what could be in the future, mm. The other, the other thing that I look at is like, you know, we are, we are given a, a good example of what our future could look like. If we just look at the uh, UAPs and how they function, right? Right. And, and so, you know, I, in my book, I say, well, what, ha what if we, how, how did, first of all, how do they operate? There's no... There's no, you don't see afterburners kicking in when they shoot off at a thousand miles an hour, uh, or turn a and turn a ninety degree angle at a thousand miles an hour. I mean, those things are uh, remarkable, and and if you say, well, okay, we're just looking at the product now, and it's similar to looking at the Great Pyramid and saying, okay, I I, I see a little piece of what's going on here. What else is going on? And you look at the UAPs, and I, I would say, well, what if we followed those UAPs back to where they came from? Who made them? How were they made? You know? I mean, do you have old Joe in the machine shop? He's on a drill press going, <laughs> you know, chewing tobacco <laughs> and waiting for a tea break. I, you, you don't know. I mean, it's kind of like, how how did they come? How did they come to exist? What? What kind of, uh, how do they function? Because obviously they are defying gravity mm. uh, uh, and, and they are unbelievably capable. Uh, so, I, I, you know, and the question I, in my mind, and I asked the question in the book, what do their power plants look like? Right. You know, do, I mean, if you go, go back to their home base and look at their cities, what do their cities look like? Would you would you see smokestacks in the in the distance, with uh, you know smoke billowing out of them and trains of coal being delivered to them, and uh, or maybe brightly glowing pyramids? I don't know. <laughs> so you know, it's it's kind of like what is our future going to look like? Uh, you go back a hundred years, what we have now doesn't you know it, it doesn't look at all like it did a hundred years ago. So if you go 100 years into the future, what's it going to look like then? Ancient Egypt, perhaps. Back to the future. Giza. Never know. Giza, the Tesla connection, acoustical science, and the harvesting of clean energy. Christopher, what a great pleasure. Fascinating. And I, uh, uh, how do people get a copy of the book? Well, uh, it's available at all online bookstores uh, in uh, paperback, uh, audio, and uh, also uh, e-reader, um, and and also the brick and mortar stores, those that still exist. Yeah, let's support the we'll, brick and mortar. We'll have it, and hopefully it will make its way into the library system, and and people can check one out. And the website is gizapower.com. Gizapower.com. The link is in the episode notes. Christopher, thank you so much. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.